Welcome to the Ocean International Community Church. An incredible young man of God. And uh, his name is Pastor Jordan Miller. He is a student ministries pastor at Trinity Church in Cedar Hill, Texas. It's one of the largest student ministries in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And uh, we've had the opportunity to be around this church for a long, long time. Uh, they partner with us as as a family of missionaries. They support us every month, and it's an honor uh, to be part of their missions program. Uh, they're a heavy supporter of missions all over the world, thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars all over the world. Every continent you can think of, Trinity Church uh, has their fingerprints on. And uh, this young man is an incredible minister of God. And as becoming an incredible friend, we are blessed this morning uh, to have a man of his caliber on this platform. And so I want you guys to help give me a great ocean welcome to Pastor Jordan Miller. Wait, 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 wait. We need to really give honor where honor is due. Can you honor with me your pastor, <laughs> Pastor Jimmy Priscilla? They have built an incredible, incredible church, amazing leaders. We have been so impressed with what God is doing through you uh, and with them at the leadership. And also, he's got a birthday. He's got a birthday this week. Can we sing happy birthday real quick? Yes? 50 years old. Come on, somebody. Hey! You guys start it because I'm not a good singer. Happy Amen, amen, amen. We have a tradition at our church, so if you want to remain standing, we're going to remain standing for the Word of God this morning. How many of you are ready for the Word? Yes. You don't have to stand through my whole Word, just the Scripture reading, so in case any of you got nervous. Uh, open your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Uh, we will be there, and then we will also hop back uh, to 2 Chronicles 34, verse 1 through 3. Uh, but starting with Romans 12, 2. You ready? Say amen. amen. If you need some more time, say hold up. Hold up. Well, <laughs> come on. If not, it's on the screen. So there you go. Uh, Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We're going to jump to 2 Chronicles 34, verse 1, and it says this, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and he walked in the ways of David his father, and he did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet a boy, he began to seek the God of David his father, and in the twelfth year he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the Asherim, and the carved and the metal images. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for your work. We thank you for this time of being able to worship together. I thank you for this community, this church, this light to this city. God, we just ask that this morning you would speak to us, change us to look more like your son, Jesus. In your name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, there are certain days that you will remember more than others, yes? There are certain days that will stick out in your memory, in your mind more than others. Some of those, I can remember some of those would be walking out of school for the last time. Hello, yes? You guys remember that day when you walked out, turned in that final paper? Uh, some of those days will be the day that you met the one. Anybody in here remember that day? Some of the single people in here going, I'm waiting for it. Amen. Yes. Who's going to claim it right now? You ready for it? Uh, the day you met the one, the day your children are born, you will remember forever. Uh, and one of those days for me was the day that I got engaged to the love of my life. Uh, yes, I won. Uh, she settled. Uh, so <laughs> no, I'm just playing. Uh, but I will remember that day forever. Uh, I, I, am, I have to give you some, some notice. I, in, in America, uh, there is this tradition for engagements. I don't know if they do this in Tanzania. Do they do this in Tanzania? Like, tr engagements have to be big. 
They have to be like spectacular. And everybody's always posting them on social media. So like you gotta one up the person who went before you, who got engaged before you. There's just, it's gotta be a big spectacle. Uh, romantic, flowers, all sorts of things. And the problem is I am not romantic. Like I'm bad at it. Anybody here bad at it? Okay, I am bad at it. Uh, and so, but I did realize, I knew one thing, that if I wanted to be romantic, which I need to be for my wife, uh, for, or for my soon-to-be wife, uh, I have to do things that she likes rather than things that I like, okay? Uh, any single people, take notes. Uh, <laughs> and so I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do something she likes. Now here's the deal, uh, we, we lived in this area uh, called Salt Lake City, Utah, and there are beautiful, beautiful mountains, mountain ranges, uh, massive, massive mountains. Uh, and me, I'm a city boy. I like electricity, I like air conditioning, hello. I don't like bugs, animals, any of that, I don't like it. Uh, she's a country girl. She loves to get dirty, she loves to be in the wilderness, she plays with animals, she it's weird. I don't understand it, but she likes it. Uh, so I thought, okay, I'm gonna do what she likes to do. So I decided that I would take her on a hike um, for our engagement, I'd take her on the hike, and it was this hike to the top of this mountain. At the top of this mountain, there was this beautiful, beautiful, massive waterfall that fell down about 100 feet, and, and just the mist was in the air, and it cascaded into this shallow pool of water, and I thought, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna take her up there, I'm gonna get down on one knee, right? And fellas, you know how we drop our voice when we're trying to impress our lady, right? <laughs> and I'll be like, baby, will you marry me? And she was gonna faint, I was gonna catch her before she got in the water, it was gonna be all good. Uh, that was how I had expected it to happen. But it did not go that way, people. It did not, it didn't happen. Uh, I don't know if you know, but hiking is really, really hard. I didn't know this. We were like 15 minutes into a two hour hike and I am slowly dying. I'm begging, the, I'm like, Jesus! And I'm making deals with the Lord. I'm like, Lord, if you will just get me to the top of this mountain, I will serve you for the rest of my life. I promise. I kept taking breaks. I'm like, girl, come here, sit down. Let's look at God's creation. Let's just look how beautiful it is. It is amazing, isn't it? Uh, but so we, I survived. I'm still here. Uh, so we get to the top of the mountain. There's the waterfall. It's coming down, shallow pool of water. I'm like, yes, this is the moment. This is it. Uh, and you ever do something stupid? I did something stupid. I, didn't, I don't know why, I, I have no idea why I did it. Uh, but before we left for the hike, I took the ring and I put it in a bag of trail mix. Trail mix is like a big bag of nuts, M&Ms, raisins, all mixed together. I put the ring in a bag of trail mix. I don't know why, I'm not really sure. I just did. So I put it in the bag of trail mix. Uh, we get up there, we sit down, and we're, we're hanging out. We're uh, kind of sitting on a rock in the pool of water. And, and I look over at her and I have the bag of trail mix and I was like, hey, hey girl, you want some trail mix? <laughs> and she looks at me and goes, no. <laughs> I'm like, you sure you're not hungry? <laughs> she goes, no, I don't really like trail mix. <laughs> Finally, I said, girl, eat the trail mix. <laughs> I handed her the trail mix, she saw the ring. I got down on one knee, she said yes, I won. End of story. Uh, but it did not go how, yes, thank you. It did not go how I had expected it. It fell very short of my expectations and I'm sure it fell short of hers. Uh, but I wanna talk to you this morning about what do we do when our expectations from God aren't met? What do we do, what happens when God doesn't meet our expectations. More times than I can care to count, I encounter young people and, and, and people who have been in the faith for a long time who begin to leave their faith. Generally, it has to do with something to the fact that they're disappointed in what God did or did not do based off of something that they had expected. Many times we, we, can, we can place expectations of God. Many, many we should. Listen, we are children of God. We can expect him to love us unconditionally. We can expect that he died for our sins, he rose again. Those things we can hold true to, but there are other things that are still somewhat, uh, we, don't, we don't quite understand. Sometimes we pray for things and God shows up and answers. Sometimes in the middle of our storms and our trials and tribulations, we see God move, we see him heal people, we see him provide for us, we see him move, but there are other times we don't. 
There are other times we pray for the sick and they're not healed. There are other times we pray for provision, provisions and things to happen and we don't see it happen. And, 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 and so that it's not so clear as to what we can always expect. There are times where we don't see God show up and move when we expect him to move. And so the question is, is how do we handle it? How do we continue to believe and trust in a God who we're not sure can meet our expectations? What do we do when God doesn't meet our expectations? And I believe that, that in order to understand this, we have to look at Romans 12 too, where it says you have to think differently. You have to have a transforming of your mind to see his good and his perfect and his acceptable will. We have to be willing to transform our thinking. And so to talk about this, I'd like to actually jump to the text of 2 Chronicles 34, and we're looking at the story of King Josiah. And a couple of things to know about King Josiah right away. Uh, king Josiah is eight years old when he becomes king. Uh, I'm not giving an eight-year-old nothing, but they gave him the kingdom. Uh, and so eight years old when he becomes king, uh, you have to know this. His grandfather was the most wicked king in all of Israel. His father was a wicked king as well. They had turned the hearts of the Israelites away from God to serve false gods. And they had taken everything that represented the God of Israel out. And so here is Josiah, and he steps into his kingship. He steps in to be a king in a completely godless culture. The Bible says this, 2 Chronicles 34, it says, When he had been king for eight years he began to seek the God of David, his ancestor. And it says four years after that, he begins to go all throughout all of Israel and he begins to tear out and tear down every godless thing that he had saw. He begins to tear out all the images. He begins to tear out all the idols. He begins to tear down all the altars and he begins to rip them down. It says they chopped down the altars. He broke into pieces the shirim and the carved and the metal images. And after he had torn every godless thing out, every false god, after he had tore it all out, he then looks at his people and he says, and now it's time to repair the temple of God. So he says, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go and we're going to fix it. We're going to clean it. We're going to make it right. We're going to give excellence to what deserves excellence. And, and so he sends the people and they begin to clean. They begin to repair. They begin to build up. And as they're doing it, they find something interesting. They find the book of the law. They hadn't seen this. They hadn't read this in ages, in ages. They haven't seen it. They had never seen it. And so when the people find it, they come and, and they bring it to King Josiah. And they say, King, look what we found. And this, this book of the law was a set of rules and guidelines that God had given to Moses for how the people of Israel should look. And when he read it, he began to weep. He began to cry. It says he tore his clothes. He poured ashes on because he began to repent because he realized how wrong they were. See, it's easy to, it's easy to think that, that you're okay when you compare things to the outside. But when you compare your life to the holiness of God, it's then that you realize how, how far off you really are. And that was Josiah. He realized how far away they really were. And he's looking around and he goes, God must be angry. God must be angry. And he says this. He says his anger must be burning hot because our ancestors have not obeyed a thing that is written in this book of God. And so he tells the people, he said, listen, go and pray. Go and seek the Lord. Go and find someone who speaks to the Lord, who the Lord speaks to them, and find out what we have to do in response to how wrong that we have been as a nation. And so he sends them out, and they begin to pray, and Josiah begins to pray, and they find a prophetess, a woman who speaks to the Lord and who the Lord spoke through, and she comes back with this word, and it says this. It says, God has spoken. I am on my way to bring the doom of judgment on this place and this people. They've deserted me and taken up other gods. My anger is burning hot against this place, and nobody is going to put it out. But tell the king of Judah, because he took seriously the doom of judgment that I spoke against this place and the people, because he responded in humble repentance and taking him seriously. I will take care of you. You will have a quiet death. You will be buried in peace. You will not be around to see the doom that I'm going to bring upon this place and this people. Um, this isn't a good story. This is not a good story. This is not the fairy tale ending that you would expect. This is not what you would expect God's response to be when a leader of a nation turns a nation back to God. 
This isn't, this isn't what we would expect. So what does Josiah do? He hears this, and then his first response is, gather up all the people. Bring them around. We're going to read the word of the Lord. And he does. It says, this, the king stood by his pillar, and before God, solemnly swore, solemnly committed himself to the covenant to follow God believingly and obediently. He commits his life to spread God's word. And then everyone around him in verse 32, it says this, everyone in Jerusalem and Benjamin committed themselves and they did it. They followed through. All throughout Josiah's life, the people kept to the straight and narrow, obediently following God, the God of their ancestors. I truly believe that Josiah had it in his heart that even though he had heard God's response, that there was something inside of him that said, if I will still just obey, maybe God will relent. Maybe God will still show his mercy towards us. And he continued to obey, but in get, uh, instead God said, no, 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 I will not save you. I'll give you peace, but the doom will still come to this place. And yet despite his unmet expectations, he thought differently. He continued to trust the will of God. He, he obeyed God's law. Now, I don't know about you, but if that were me, I would have said, God, if you're going to punish me for this anyways, then why would I act any different? God, if you're going to give me the punishment for something that I don't deserve, why should I change? Why should I act any differently if you are going to give me the punishment of, of, of acting that way anyways? God, if you're not going to show up in my circumstances in the way that I think you should, then why should I continue to obey? This goes against everything that we've been taught, right? If you obey, you get a reward. If you do the right thing, you get the right thing. You do, you get. I do it with my son. You, you go pee-pee in the potty, great. You get a little candy. You know what I mean? It's, it's the give and it's the, it's, it's the take. We get something because we've done something, and this goes completely against it. Sometimes for me... This is one of the most maddening things about Christianity. One of my hardest things in my walk with the Lord is, is that I can do the right thing and I can watch others who are doing the wrong thing yet getting the reward I think I deserve. Yeah. Getting the things that I thought I should have got. What I expected God to give me. Yeah. You ever felt like that? Like, God, why can't I just act like everyone else? Why can't I just do what everyone else is doing? Because they're getting the things that I want anyways. Here's Josiah. Josiah didn't want to do what everyone else had done. Josiah decided that he would be different. He decided that he would follow God's plan, even if that meant they wouldn't be saved. Do we have that kind of faith? Lord, even if you don't come through, even if you don't save me, I will serve you. I will honor you. I will live for you. I will live a life of holiness. I will be set apart. And I, I struggled with this story because I, I was talking to a friend of mine at, at one point, and I said, listen, I said, I like Josiah. I hate his story. I like Josiah. I like what he did. I do not like his story because I don't get it. And I even argued back and forth with God. I said, Lord, I please help me understand why would you tell his story? Because it doesn't fit, at least in the American paradigm of Christianity, of, of doing the right thing and getting the right response. God, why would you tell this story? It doesn't make sense. The nation still perished. The nation was still destroyed. They were still carried off and into captivity to become slaves to other nations. What kind of moral of the story is that, Lord? And I began to read, and I began to pray, and I began to study. Uh, and it's not like revelatory. It's not revelation for most people. But for me in that moment, it was. I realized something that changed my whole perspective on this story. I found something that changed how I looked at what it was that Josiah did. You see, in the time of King Josiah, he brought all of these changes. He got rid of a godless culture and introduced God to him again. And when he did that, revival began. People began serving God, but more importantly than that, check this out, parents began to teach their children once again about who God was. They were teaching them how to serve him, how to love him, how to follow the heart of God. They were teaching them how to do it, how to obey God, even if it didn't benefit them. There was an obedience without the benefit. There was an obedience without the benefit. 
And history shows us that there were some young men who were born during this time of revival. The world didn't know their names then, but we know them now. Their names are Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And here are these young men who were captives of Babylon, but they held firm to their beliefs that in the face of direct opposition towards them brought God to a completely godless culture. All of a sudden, I understood something. The actions of a king who had nothing to gain by turning a nation to God ended up causing other godless nations to meet God for the first time. We see in the story of the three Hebrew boys, we we see them, and and, and there they are, And they're getting ready to, the the king makes a decree, says, listen, when the music plays, you will bow down to this idol and you will worship it. And they said, no, we won't. And he said, listen, I've heard that you're not bowing down to this idol. If you don't bow down to this idol, I'll throw you into this fiery furnace. And they said, Queli? (laughs) He said, Queli, Queli. And they said, well, it doesn't matter anyways. They said, listen, we know our God is able to deliver us. We will never bow down to this idol. But even if he doesn't, even if he doesn't meet our expectations of how he would save us, we will never bow down. And there they are. And so the king throws them into the fire. And most of us know the story, right? He throws in three, but the king is standing there and looks and he says, didn't we throw in three? Why do I see four? And the fourth looks like the son of God. And he says, hurry, get them out, get them out, get them out. And they come out. And this is what a godless king in a godless nation says. He said, blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angels and rescued his servants who trusted him. They ignored the king's orders, laid their bodies on the line, rather than serve or worship any god but their own. Therefore, I issue this decree. Anyone, anywhere of any race, color, or creed who says anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be ripped to pieces, limb from limb, their houses torn down. There has never been a God who can pull off a rescue like this. We see in the story of Daniel, Daniel is told, do not pray. There's a decree again. Do not pray to any, anybody, anything, any deity except to the king. And Daniel says, Queli? He says, I'm going to pray to the one I know who who I should pray to. I'm going to pray to the God of Israel, the God of Jacob, the God of Isaac. I am going to pray to that God. I will pray to him like I'd have every single day. And he gets down on his knees. He prays just as he had done before. He acted in obedience. What happens, the king and his people, they snatch him up. They throw him into a den of lions. And as he's sitting there in a den of lions, what happens? An angel comes and shuts the mouths of lions. The next morning, he walks out, and again, a godless king and a godless culture says this in Daniel 6, 25. I decree that Daniel's God shall be worshipped and feared in all parts of my kingdom. He is the living God, world without end. His kingdom never fails. His rule continues eternally. He is a savior and a rescuer. He performs astonishing miracles in heaven and on earth. Maybe we gain nothing. Maybe you and I gain nothing. Maybe everything that we expect from God falls flat. But maybe in the nothingness that we gain, someone else gains everything. Maybe in the nothingness that we gain, someone else gains everything. Maybe you will never see the miracle occur in your life because the miracle is meant to be done in your sons and in your daughters. Maybe you will never see the miracle in your life because it it will happen in the next generation. Maybe it is through your obedience and unmet expectations that will allow other people to see God's miracles in their life. I have a picture of, of my son. I want to put it up real quick. Somebody took this picture, this right here. My son's five now, but he was about one and a half at that point in time. Um, and you can come up. He's about one and a half at that time. And I was preaching at a young adult service and uh, preaching my heart out, all this and that. Uh, and then somebody showed me this picture afterwards. And immediately the Lord said, your life is not about what you do on the stage. Your life is what you do while he's watching. Your obedience matters, not your presentation. Your obedience matters, not your presentation. So my obedience, to be honest, I I hope I'm obedient and I can give you a word, but my obedience, he's who I'm obeying for. 
so that he can see the miracles in his life based off of me serving God in my life. Maybe there's a generation of young people who are looking at you right now saying, I wonder what they will do. Listen, this gospel is not about our gain. It is not about us. It is not about God meeting our expectations, our hopes, our dreams. It's about God. It's about building his kingdom. When we choose to obey and be different simply because God will cause something greater in someone else's life. What if we obey and no one cares? But what if we obey and it means everything? There was uh, about five years ago, uh, my family and I, we've been a one car family um, operating that way for quite a while. And my sister who lived on the other side, I lived in Dallas, Texas. She lived in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. It's about a 15 hour difference in time if you drive. And she called me and she said, hey look, I'm about to buy a new car but I will not get any value for it if I trade it in. So if you can fly out here and drive the car back, you can have it. I said, done. So I'm on, <laughs> get on a plane, I fly out. Um, and so I get the car and she, I, I don't, she had a CD player in there. I don't own any CDs. All my music I listen to on my phone. So I was like, okay, I'm not driving 15 hours with no music, you know what I'm saying? Uh, and so, so I went to this store, it's called Best Buy. I went to the store uh, and had them put in a new, uh, new thing for them to be able to play my music listen to it, talk to people on the phone. Uh, and as I'm pulling out, I call my wife and there was a Bluetooth function so I could call my wife on the phone. Uh, and I called her and she couldn't hear me but I could hear her. So I was like, okay, something must be wrong with the microphone. So I pulled back into Best Buy. I was like, hey, I just bought this, you just installed it, but the microphone isn't working, it's not picking up any signal. He said, oh, I probably just got unplugged, let me check it out. So he's, he gets in the car, sits down, leans over, and as he leans over, he goes, oh, my back. And as soon as he said that, I heard the Lord say, pray for his back. And I went, no. He's <laughs> like, Jordan, pray for his back. I was like, I don't want to pray for his back. Pray for his back. Lord, I'm in Las Vegas. If you don't know about Las, Las Vegas, there's a lot of weird people. There's a lot of cuckoo, crazy people. I'm like, Lord, Las Vegas is crazy enough. That she doesn't, he doesn't need me to think I'm one of the other crazy people. He's like, so he gets up. The guy's like, let me go to the other side. He gets up. Goes to the other side, he gets in, he's like, oh, that's better, but man, that still hurts. And again, and I'm being stubborn, and the Lord says, pray for his back. I was like, Lord, you pray for his back. You're better at this than me. You do it. I'll stand here, watch you. You get the glory. Uh, and he's like, pray for his back. I said, okay, but fire from heaven better fall in this room. Everybody better get saved. That's what I'm expecting. So the guy gets out of the car, comes over. He's like, all right, everything's working. You're good. I was like, hey, I heard you say uh, your back hurts. Uh, listen, I, I'm a Christian. I believe in God. I believe that he can heal. I believe that he can do miracles. Do you mind if I pray for your back? And he was like, oh, okay, cool. And he begins walking off. But I'm trying to, like, put my hand on his back. So I'm chasing him around with my hand. <laughs> and as he finally looks at me, and he's like, I was like, I want to pray right now. He goes, oh, okay. So, he, <laughs> so I put my hand on his back. There's another lady in there. She's like. So I pray. Say my prayer. In Jesus' name. Amen. And I wanted to do the really Pentecostal thing, like, can you touch your toes? Could you do something you couldn't do before? Can you jump around? Uh, but based off of the look that he had given me, uh, it was like, all right, buddy, it's time for you to leave. And so I just said, well, God bless. And I left, got my car. Uh, and if I can be transparent and honest, I was very, very angry with the Lord. I said, Lord, how could you do that to me? You made me look like an idiot. Why would you do that? I thought he was going to get healed and then saved and then all the best by a revival would have happened in Las Vegas. And what are you? And I had a 15 hour car ride to argue with the Lord. How I many you know that wasn't going to go well for me? So we're, I'm driving and I'm about an hour in and I'm just still going like, Lord, why, 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 why would you do that to me? Why would you not show up? And finally, like I said, about an hour in, he says, Are you done? I said, Yes, sir. <laughs> He goes, Jordan, what did I ask you to do? I said, you asked me to pray for his back. He goes, what'd you do? I said, I prayed for his back. I said, good job, son. Wait, what? No, 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 no. This was not, what do you mean? He said, Jordan, what did I ask you to do? I asked you to pray for his back. What did you do? I prayed for his back. Good job, son. I don't get it. I didn't understand it. I'm like, Lord, you're going to have to do some more explaining. I don't understand this. 
He said, you were looking for a story, I was looking for a person. He said, you were looking for something different. He goes, in you, I wanted obedience. He goes, I have a plan for him. I have a plan for him. He goes, maybe tomorrow morning he'll wake up and his back will be healed. And he's going to seek me out. Maybe tomorrow he'll go, who is Jesus? And he'll start looking and he'll talk to his family and he'll talk to his friends and he'll invite them and he'll bring them to church and they'll start searching after me and he'll change a complete generation and legacy of a family because they found out about me. He goes, but do you know what? You will never know. Because all I wanted from you was obedience. And that highlighted a season in my life where I had been chasing this idea of what success looked like. And many times I promised I wanted to quit. I was ready to quit ministry. I was ready to get out. I was ready to be done because I just kept chasing this idea. And God finally highlighted in this season, and he said this to me. He said, son, in the kingdom of God, obedience is success. In the kingdom of God, obedience is success success. So will we think differently? Will we, like Romans 12, 2, have our minds transformed to the good and the perfect will of God? Not our will, not our expectations, but trust in his will for his purpose. I want to challenge us today to be different, to think differently, to trust and to obey God. The purpose this morning was not really to tell you why God doesn't show up or what to do with your unmet expectations and how to handle it, but really was to just challenge you and say, listen, all the Lord is seeking is for a seed of obedience in your life. We don't get to determine how it grows or when it grows, but no seed of God returns void. No seed of God returns void, and he's seeking our obedience. So will there be a group of people in here who would plant seeds of obedience and let the Lord do with him as he pleases? Will we think differently? Will we trust God? Will we obey God? Because God is still working things out for the good, for the good of those who love him. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I do feel the the need to ask. I want to know if there's anyone in here who has some unmet expectations from the Lord. And maybe you're hurt. Maybe you're bitter. Maybe there's there's something inside you that still feels some sort of twinge when when, when things happen because you feel like the Lord didn't show up. I want to just pray for, for just for your heart to be healed. Is there anyone in here that would say I have some unmet expectations from God and it still causes a wound in my life? Would you raise your hands? I just want to pray for you. Hands all over. Hands all over. So, Jesus, we just pray right now for every hand that is raised. I pray right now we speak healing to hearts. We speak healing to hearts in the name of Jesus. God, that there would be a healing. God, from the things that they are bitter about, God, I pray right now that there would be a healing in their hearts. God, I pray that you would show them. God, even if they don't see what will happen, they know that you are good and that your plans for them are good. So, God, I pray right now for their hearts to be healed. God, for their obedience to remain and to remain strong despite things not working out the way they thought they should. Heal their hearts, Jesus, in Jesus' name. And the second thing I want to pray for is this. If there's anyone in here this morning and you're saying, I have some decisions that I'm getting ready to have to make. And I know I should choose one, but I don't think it's going to be good for me. I know what the Lord is saying or I know what I should do, but, but it, I'm struggling with it. I'm struggling with a decision right now that is requiring an act of obedience and I need strength. If that's you this morning, would you raise your hand? Again, hands all over. Amen. God, I just pray right now your Holy Spirit would fill these people. Your Holy Spirit would empower and strengthen these people to be able to do your will, to do what it is that you have asked. God, fill us, Lord, 
with your spirit, with your strength, with your courage, so that we can be obedient, so that we can bring God to the godless situations in our life, so that we can bring God to a godless culture that we see, so that we can be a light here in Dar es Salaam, that we can be a light to our community, a light to our families. God, let our obedience be planted as a seed. Thank you, Jesus, not for what we see, but for your good and your perfect will. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. amen. amen.